with the identification of cytochrome C, APEP1, and caspase 9, a picture was emerging of the molecular events that lead to the irreversible commitment of a mammalian cell to the apoptotic phase. Apoptotic stimuli lead to the activation of sensors, which results in the direct or indirect activation of the effectors of the BCL2 superfamily, BAX and BAC. Once activated, BAX and BAC cause a selective permeabilization of the outer mitochondrial membrane through a mechanism that is still unknown. This permeabilization allows cytochrome C release from the intermembrane space into the cytoplasm. The binding in the cytoplasm of cytochrome C to APEF1 monomers triggers apoptosome assembly. The assembled apoptosome facilitates the activation of the initiator caspase, caspase 9, which, once fully active, cleaves and activates the effector caspase, caspase 3. The activation of caspase 3 can be considered the point of no return, the event that irreversibly commits a cell to the apoptotic fate. Active caspases induce the processes that lead to molecule changes typical of apoptotic cells, such as PS externalization and DNA fragmentation, which altogether result in the dismantling of the cell and its engulfment and degradation. How conserved are these molecule steps in the worm in C. elegans? Let's look at the genetic pathways in worms and mammals and compare them. Then let's see what we know about each of the steps at the molecular level. And that let's start at the bottom. In mammals, a cascade of caspases is activated in response to apoptotic stimuli. However, in C. elegans, it appears to be just one caspase, C3, that is activated. Why a cascade of caspases in mammals, but not in C. elegans? A cascade of caspases may allow the amplification of the apoptotic signal, like a snowball effect. It may also allow for additional regulation. Since cells undergo apoptosis very fast in C. elegans, within less than an hour, compared to presumably many hours or even days in mammals, an amplification step and additional levels of regulation may not be necessary in C. elegans. But that's just a speculation. Let's move up one step. APEF1-like proteins are required for the activation of the first caspases in both pathways. And in both pathways, these proteins assemble into an apoptosome, which is required for the activation of the caspases. In one of the last sections, I told you about the structure of the mammalian apoptosome, as determined by cryoelectron microscopy of single apoptosome particles at a resolution of 12.8 angstrom. In 2010, Yi Gong Shi and co workers published a crystal structure of the C. elegans apoptosome at a resolution of 3.55 angstrom. So, with much better resolution and therefore more detailed structural information. Interestingly, the C. elegans apoptosome turns out to be octomeric. It is a circular structure with eight rather than seven spokes. Furthermore, rather than a flat, wheel-like form, as had been suggested by the stru structural studies on the mammalian apoptosome, the crystal structure of the C. elegans apoptosome suggests a funnel or cone-shaped form. And finally, rather than up to eight molecules of pro C3, the C. elegans apoptosome appears to bind only two pro C3 molecules. The binding is mediated through the CAR domains present in both pro-Z3 and Z4. 
the two prosit 3 molecules bound per apoptosome presumably are forced to dimerize, which then leads to their cleavage in trans and their full activation. So far, everything seems to be quite conserved at the molecule level. However, moving even more upstream in the pathways, things start to become different. In the mammalian pathway, there is cytochrome C upstream of APEF1. However, there is no cytochrome C upstream of Z4 in the C. elegans pathway. The difference between the mammalian apoptosome and the C. elegans apoptosome is in the way their assemblies are regulated. Remember, the assembly of the mammalian apoptosome is dependent on cytochrome C binding to monomeric APEF1 in the cytoplasm. And the availability of cytochrome C in the cytoplasm is controlled by the BCL2 superfamily and the effectors BAX and BAC in particular. Therefore, in mammals, the BCL2 superfamily indirectly regulates apoptosome assembly by controlling cytochrome C release. However, the C. elegans apoptosome can assemble in the absence of cytochrome C. The crystal structure was generated just with Z4. Therefore, apoptosome assembly in C. elegans is not dependent on the availability of cytochrome C in the cytoplasm. How is it regulated then? And does the BCL2 superfamily play a role in it as well? Yes, the BCL2 superfamily does play a role. And it even plays a, a direct role. It turns out that in C. elegans, the assembly of the apoptosome is not actively induced in cells that are destined to die by apoptosis, but is actively blocked in healthy non-apoptotic cells. In no cells that are then destined to die, this block is relieved, allowing apoptosome assembly and pro 3 activation. How is apoptosome assembly actively blocked in healthy non-apoptotic cells. It is blocked to a direct physical interaction between the guardian Z9 and Z4. In 1997, a number of investigators independently reported that Z9 and Z4 can interact. Therefore, in C. elegans, the BCL2 superfamily and Z9 in particular directly regulate apoptosome assembly. Interestingly, a few months after these findings were published, it was reported in two independent publications that, similar to what had been observed in C. elegans, mammalian BCL-XL and APEF1 physically interacted. The author's conclusions were mainly based on observations made with tissue culture cells that overexpressed both bcl XL and APEF1. So maybe there are two ways to trigger apoptosome assembly in mammals, a direct and an indirect way. No, there appears to be only the indirect way, mediated through cytochrome C release. A year after it was claimed that BCL XL can interact with APEF1, three independent reports refuted this finding. And it is now generally accepted that what had been reported was an artifact of BCL-XL and APEF1 overexpression. If apoptosome assembly in C. elegans is blocked through the physical interaction between Z9 and Z4, how is the block relieved in cells that are destined to die? Again, the BCL2 superfamily plays an important role in that. Remember that Z9 can also interact with AGA1, the C. elegans sensor. The way we think the block on apoptosome assembly is relieved is the following. In the 131 cells that are destined to die during C. elegans development, the sensor AGA1 binds to Z9. AGA1 binding to Z9 induces a major conformational change in the Z9 protein. This conformational change leads to the loss of the Z4 binding surface in the Z9 protein and, consequently, 
the release of SID4 from the SID9 protein. Actually, SID9 binds to a dimer of SID4, and this dimer is released upon ego1 binding to SID9. Four SID4 dimers can then assemble into an octomeric structure, the apoptosome. The model on how ego1 binding to SID9 triggers apoptosome assembly is based on biochemical data obtained by a number of investigators and also on structural data. Yi Gong Shi and co workers published a series of papers in which they described the crystal structures of SID9 alone, SID9 bound to SID4, SID9 bound to a truncated ego1 protein, and the SID4 apoptosome. Not too surprising, the structure of SID9 also revealed a fold very similar to that of other BCL2-like proteins. And having structures of SID9 with either SID4 or truncated ego one protein allowed to reveal the dramatic change in SID9's conformation that is triggered by ego one binding. Just to reiterate, an important difference between the mammalian pathway and the C. elegans pathway is the way that the assembly of the apoptosome is regulated. In mammals, apoptosome assembly is actively induced by cytochrome C release in those cells that are destined to die. And cytochrome C release is controlled by the BCL2 superfamily. In contrast, in C. elegans, apoptosome assembly is actively blocked by the guardian SID9 in healthy non-apoptotic cells, and this block is relieved by the sensor ego one in no cells that are destined to die. Does cytochrome C really have no role in the C elegans pathway? So far, there is no evidence that it does. However, so far, there is also no convincing evidence that it doesn't. Mutations in cytochrome C have not come out of any of the C. elegans cell death screens. However, the two C. elegans cytochrome C genes appear to be essential for viability, and the C. elegans cell death screens performed so far required that the mutants be viable. Therefore, mutations in cytochrome C genes might, not, might have been missed. Also, there are two cytochrome C genes that may act redundantly. Again, one more reason why mutations in cytochrome C might not have come out of these genetic screens. Is cytochrome C released from the intermembrane space in the 131 cells that are programmed to die? We have tried to determine that, but ran into technical problems, which we have not yet solved. Therefore, at least as far as I know, it is still unknown whether cytochrome C is released in cells programmed to die in C. elegans. Fact is that the C. elegans SID4 protein is missing the WD40 repeat domain of APAF1, which mediates the interaction between APAF1 and cytochrome C. Furthermore, the C. elegans apoptosome can assemble in the absence of cytochrome C. And why should cytochrome C be released if it is not required for apoptosome assembly? While it is still unclear whether cytochrome C is released from the intermembrane space in C. elegans, there is some evidence that another proapoptotic factor might be released. This factor is the C. elegans homolog of AIF, the apoptosis inducing factor. In mammals, AIF is released from the intermembrane space of mitochondria concomitantly with or shortly after cytochrome C. And Ding Shu and co-workers published that the C. elegans homolog of AIF can be released from mitochondria in response to ego one expression. This observation suggests that the outer mitochondrial membrane might become selectively permeabilized in C. elegans as well. Maybe not to release cytochrome C, but AIF and potentially other factors. If that was the case, who is responsible for this permeabilization? A factor such as BACs? Remember, there is no BACs in C. elegans. 
But I also told you a few sections ago that in cells destined to die, SET9 adopts a pro-apoptotic function. And I hypothesized that SET9 bound to AGO1 may have a function that is like that of activated backs in mammals. And therefore, I speculate that if outer mitochondrial membrane permeabilization occurs in C. elegans, it might be dependent on AGO1 and SET9. And this is something we should really test.